In this video, I'm going to discuss what is called parameter independence and outcome independence. And so in the previous videos on Bell's theorem, I've essentially been saying that what Bell's theorem and the experiments that test it show is that there can be no local hidden variables. But there is kind of a catch to this or a caveat, and that's this idea of parameter independence in particular, but parameter and outcome independence. So let us again think of a Bell inequality type experiment where we have our detector for particle one and our detector for particle two. These are particles that are entangled with each other. Then we have this right here. So I'm showing it as a stern gerlach experiment, but we know from the previous video is that this is usually done with light polarization, but these are equivalent systems in which to do these experiments. So we can choose between our A prime and our A over here. These are 90 degrees from each other. And then Bob on the right can choose between B and C that are 90 degrees from each other, but 45 degrees off from A on the left here, on Alice's arm of the experiment. And these are some distance D that can be very far apart indeed, because remember we're talking about entanglement here. So simply put, parameter independence and outcome independence says that nothing in one arm of the experiment can affect the other arm. In other words, the two are causally independent of each other. And so that is the thing that we want when we are doing a Bell inequality type experiment, because we want to have complete plausible deniability about any sort of interaction happening between these two arms of the experiment that could be explained in a relativistically causal way. So perimeter independence says that choosing whether to use, say, B or C in the right arm of the experiment should not influence the left arm of the experiment and vice versa. So whether Bob here chooses B or C should not influence whatever happens over on Alice's side of the experiment and vice versa. Mathematically, this can be represented this way. So the probability that Alice on the left side gets spin up given that Bob chose B is equal to the probability that Alice gets spin up on the left side given that Bob chose C. And so neither of those things should influence the left side. So the decision of which one of these to use, whether he uses the B direction or the C direction, should not influence what happens on Alice's side. In other words, if Alice is on the left arm of the experiment choosing whether to use A or A prime, she cannot be influenced by whatever Bob chooses in the right arm of the experiment. Outcome independence, on the other hand, says that when the setting of the distant apparatus is specified, so now that we have the setting specified, then the outcome must not affect the other side. So now we're talking about the outcome, whether it actually is spin up or spin down on one side should not affect the other side. For instance, Alice measuring spin up in the left wing should not affect whether Bob measures spin up or spin down in the right wing. So mathematically, we can put it this way. So the probability of, say, Alice in the left wing getting spin up given these things, so this OR here could be Bob getting spin up or spin down in the right arm, and this right here, which remember, this is just the set of the possible parameters that Bob chooses, is equal to this. So again, this is just given the parameters that Bob chooses. So we're saying that this outcome on Bob's side is not going to affect the probability of Alice getting spin up or vice versa spin down on the left side. And that would go for the other side of the experiment as well. So in other words, if Alice in the left arm of the experiment finds her particle as spin up, this outcome needs to be independent of whether Bob finds his as spin up or spin down. So local causality can essentially be defined as the conjunction of these two constraints. Thus, if either of these conditions are violated, then that means there was some kind of causal influence. Now, if the decision of which direction to use in the experiment, say between A or B, is made in each arm in a way that cannot have any local relativity obeying causal influence on the other arm, then this would indicate superluminal causation. So in the above figure, an event omega, which is here in the middle, 
will be able to have causal influence on both the left and right wing of the experiment. Because we see here, it's in the light cones of both of them, such as the entangled particles moving from the source of the detector. So we can think of omega as the source here of our particles. Events alpha right here and beta right here will not be able to affect the other one. So beta can affect this one, but it could not affect our left wing of the experiment here. And alpha can affect the left wing, but not the right wing of the experiment here. These could be, for example, Alice and Bob deciding which direction to use for their trial in the Bell inequality experiment. So whether to use on this side A or A prime and on this side B or C. We want only that omega is causally influencing the two arms, not the decisions alpha and beta of which direction to use. And so that is what we mean by parameter independence nor the outcomes of the experiments, so whether left is positive or negative, or whether right is positive or negative, and that is outcome independence. This is because if omega really does have a local hidden variable, say the particle pair upon formation decide at omega what the spin in the left direction will be spin up, and the spin in the right direction will be spin down, then Bell's inequality will not be violated. And so that would mean that there is a local hidden variable, namely the local hidden variable of choosing that the left one is spin up and the right one is spin down at the time of creation here at omega. But if Bell's inequality is violated, then this could be because of one of two things. One, there are no local hidden variables. And two, there is some sort of local relativity obeying speed of light signal going between particles on or at the detection. And so when I say that there is a caveat to these Bell experiments, this is what I mean. So this number one here is kind of the largely agreed upon interpretation of the ex experiments, but trying to rule out two here is kind of the direction that these experiments have taken since those first ones back in 1982. So ensuring parameter independence and outcome independence for any sort of local relativity obeying speed of light influence will rule out two and thus establish one. So when performing this experiment using light polarization, it is easier to control for outcome independence. This is because the photons travel at the speed of light, which is the speed of causation, or at least causation in special relativity. And so will arrive at the measuring apparatus of their arm as fast as locally relativistically possible. And so if we have our particle creation, our photon creation here at omega, we have one going to the left side here and one to the right side here. And what I mean by the fact that doing this with the speed of light makes the outcome independence easier is that in the above figure, we see that omega shooting its photon up here that photon would have to traverse x1 and x2 to get to the left side. We could do the same thing if we were looking at the left side going to the right side. And so the photon traveling at the speed of light, a signal cannot traverse the space-time distance x1 from omega to the right detector, so this first arrow, and then x2 to the left detector, so this other arrow right here, in time to communicate anything to the other photon traversing the space-time distance y right here. However, choosing the direction, the parameter, is something that must be done prior to the photons arriving at their detector. And this is why in previous videos, Norsen, and if you read any other literature on it, anyone else who talks about this, always specify that the decision on which direction to measure must be made at the late, latest possible time. So we would want, if we go back up to this one, we wouldn't want this alpha to be too far down here because then it could have some influence on the right side over here. And so we want those to be done at the latest possible time. So when performing the experiment, especially one with photons traveling at the speed of light, this is not always easy to do. No humans could do it. So between the time the entangled photons are emitted from omega and when they arrive at the detector, that's happening at the speed of light. So no human is going to be able to make some decision right here before the photon gets here. Because in fact, this omega, if we're looking at speed of light, 
would actually have to be right here at this crossing point since the photon would be moving at 45 degree angles in this space-time diagram up to the detector here. And so then it would become very difficult for a human to actually be able to decide and then control which one of the directions is actually used. And if you had a single computer, say, using a random number generator to make the decision, the signal traveling through the wire will go significantly slower than the speed of light and thus you lose parameter independence. And so this is why many Bell inequality experiments take such great pains to try to ensure parameter independence. So one such experiment is this one done by Rausch et al. in 2018 that used variations in wavelengths and light coming from distant quasars. So these things are billions of light years away in opposite parts of the sky to determine which direction or parameters to use. So the galaxies were too, uh, the two galaxies are too far away from each other to have communicated with one another their arriving photons thus causally independent. And so this is a figure from that paper right here where this S is where the photons are being generated, the entangled photons. A and B are the two arms of our experiment here. And then this line, this red line coming from the left is coming from one of the galaxies here. And this one coming from the right is coming from this other galaxy here. And so we see that these photons from those galaxies arrive while these photons are in transit. And so the differences in the wavelengths of the light coming in from those galaxies is what determines which of the two different things in each arm, the two different directions in each arm is being used. And this is another figure from that paper where we can see kind of a schematic of what they're doing here. So this is their photon source. They're shooting the photons. One is going 500 meters from this central part to over here. The other one is going 534 meters from this central part over to this one over here, where we have the basis settings here. Then we have our detectors on either side, where we see these telescopes on the far left here and on the far right are receiving photons from those galaxies. And so that's shown right here where this is our telescope. We have quasar photons coming in there and coming in here. And so that those are actually determining which one of these basis settings is being used in either wing of this experiment. And so, yeah, that is just kind of, as I said, one of the lengths that people are going to try and establish this parameter independence, which remember I said, we have to be able to rule out number two right here if we want to accept this one. And so people in these subsequent experiments have been going to great lengths to try and ensure parameter independence so that we can more firmly say that it's that there is no local hidden variables. And by the way, the results from this experiment, again, confirm the Bell's inequality. So it confirms that quantum mechanics, that non-local quantum mechanics is actually the case. And so, again, that means that there are no local hidden variables, according to the data from these experiments. Uh, but anyway, um, again, if I do have a uh, Patreon linked to in the description down below. If you find these videos interesting, you can go donate a little bit there, but I don't want to put too much pressure on you for that. I hope you found this video interesting, and I will see you in the next one.